So, in year 11, and probably even some of year 12, you learnt some rules about things being soluble, sparingly soluble, and insoluble. And so if you mix two solutions together, you could predict whether a precipitate formed or not based on those rules. For example, if I put lead nitrate with potassium iodide, I knew I'd get lead iodide, which is insoluble, and so I'd see that yellow precipitate being formed. So I can make those predictions if I knew my, my rules. And then yesterday I went and said, well, those rules aren't quite right, because everything's at least sparingly soluble. Some things are very soluble, like sodium salts and nitrate salts and potassium salts and ammonium salts. They're very soluble. So we consider them to always be soluble. Everything else we now have to think of as being sparingly soluble. But what I want to do is use that stuff from year 11 and year 12 to show you a thing called ionic product, which we use to predict whether a precipitate will occur or not now that we're at level three. So what I've got here is I've got two solutions. One is sodium hydroxide and one is calcium nitrate. And I've got the same volume of each. They're both 0 0.1. Actually, I know these are two significant figures, not one, but just for pace speed, I wrote them down as one. I know their concentration. Now, if they're the same volume, the concentration of each of those, they're both aqueous solutions, is going to be halved. So it's going to go from being 0.1 moles per litre to being half of that, 0.05. And there's one hydroxide ion in there, so I know the concentration of hydroxide in it. Likewise, if this started at 0.1 and I'm adding it to the same volume of the other stuff, then its concentration will be halved. So the concentration of calcium ions will drop from 0.1 to 0.05. Those are the two ions that are important because, going back to my year 11 and year 12 equation, I was able to say, oh, well, this one's irrelevant. The sodium ions and the nitrate ions are irrelevant because they're always soluble, so they're not important. But these two ions are really, really important because they might form a precipitate. They might. So, let's see if they do. <clears throat> Certainly do. Okay, so we've got a the precipitate in there, and then from what we've got, we predict to be calcium hydroxide. But I wouldn't have had to do the experiment to know that was going to happen. I can actually do it theoretically, so you know this is the sort of thing that could be an exam question. How do I do it? Well, yesterday we learned a thing called KS, solubility product. Now we're going to learn a thing called ionic product. The nice thing is, they have the same formula. They just have different values, and it's what the ionic product is with respect to this, the KS that tells us should that, whoops, should that have precipitated or not. Okay, So I'll walk you through that. The first thing I do is I, I found the thing that is sparingly soluble, or what we want to, might have previously called insoluble. And I write its dissociation equilibrium. So I show it trying to dissolve, assuming that it will. Then I write a thing called the ionic product expression. It looks very, very similar to the solubility product expression, doesn't it? In fact, identical. And they are they're the same equation, they're the same thing. However, Ks is for a saturated solution. So what we've been working on in our titration was a saturated solution of barium hydroxide. So that's where you use Ks, it's for a saturated solution. Um, Ionic product is not making any assumptions like that. It's saying it might be saturated, and if it is, it's called KS. It might be still a solution, didn't precipitate, or it might be a precipitate. And we know this one's going to be a precipitate because we've just done it. So if we know this, we can plug the numbers in that we know from up here because we know what we started with. We started with 0.05 moles per litre of hydroxide, so I put that number in. I started with 0.05 moles per litre of calcium ions, so I plug that number into here. So I get 0.05 times 0.05 squared, and I get 1.25 times 10 to the negative 4. No unit required. They do have units, but you can do those at uni. You don't need those for level 3. And what I notice is that my ionic product is bigger than my Ks. I've been given the Ks as 5.5 times 10 to the negative 6. So there's a difference of about 100 times bigger. So it's about a hundred times bigger, this ionic product. And what did we observe happened? What did we observe when I did mix the two chemicals together? A precipitate. a precipitate. So we could make an inference that if the ionic product is bigger than Ks, what's going to occur? 
precipitation. Okay, conversely, let's use a bit of lateral thinking then. If the ion product was smaller, so let's say this was something times 10 to the negative 7, for example, so about 10 times smaller, what would you predict would happen? No precipitate. The ions would be there, but they wouldn't be in a high enough concentration to form a precipitate. There'd be enough other things happening in that solution that they wouldn't join together. Okay? So... Now, last possibility, and this is what you're going to find with your titration, this is what you're working with with your titration, is where the ionic product equals the Ks. And it's our third possibility. What would you observe there? So it's suspension. You wouldn't, this would be what would look like a suspension because it's going to precipitate. Oh, okay. Good thought though. If they equal, it will look the same as this one actually. You won't see a precipitate. But it would be a special type of solution, what we call that type of solution. Because you're right, if I add even just a bit more, it will make a precipitate. Even one more crystal or drop would start precipitation. What do we call that solution? We can't add any more of either ion. Saturated. Good. So if the ion product equals the Ks, we call it a saturated solution. Even just one more drop of either of those solutions would cause a precipitate to, to form. Okay? That adding one more thing is what we call the common ion effect. And I'm going to quickly show you that as well, because it's quite an easy concept. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some lime water in here, which is a saturated solution of calcium hydroxide. So if I was to work out, if I knew my iron concentrations in here, IP would equal KS. Looks like a solution. There's nothing floating in that yet. I'm going to add sodium hydroxide. Now, sodium hydroxide is not calcium hydroxide. But it does have one of those ions available in solution that is in... Here, which one? Hydroxide. Hydroxide. It has a common ion. And watch what happens when I add just a little bit to it. It precipitates. So I've now made it so that the concentration of hydroxide has been increased, which has done what to my IP? Increased, increased it. So if IP has got bigger, initially IP equals KS because it's what sort of solution? Saturated. Saturated. If I add just a little bit more of a common iron, it was sodium hydroxide, which is highly soluble, but it has hydroxides in it, a common iron. It lifts this value up, which lifts this value up, which means this statement is true, and sure enough, that's what we observe. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so in a nutshell, we've just gone through using a thing called ionic product and comparing it to solubility product to predict precipitation, whether it occurs or not. And we've looked at a thing called the common iron effect saying, oh, using this idea, if I have a saturated solution and I add a little bit more of one of the two ions, even though it's from a highly soluble solution, it will lift the IP bigger than KS, causing precipitation to occur.